Hello, welcome to Forest Focus. The FA Cup's on the back burner as Premier League football returns tomorrow with Newcastle United, the visitors to the city ground. We're going to talk about the game, uh, put a preview together in the company of, first of all, Reds fan Mikey Clark, and then uh, basically a mate of mine who's a Newcastle fan who I used to work with called uh, Rob Smythe, who was on the podcast previously. Get his take on Newcastle's uh, very up and down season and how he sees the game from an opposition point of view. So we'll have that in the second half of the show. But uh, in the meantime, in the first half, we'll uh, speak to Mikey. Mikey, how are you doing? Yeah, all right. Yeah, really good, Matt. You okay? Yeah, good, thanks. Good. You, you know I'm okay because we were doing this straight after we recorded yesterday's podcast. Oh, no. but, <laughs> breaking down the fourth wall, but very <laughs> professional of you. Um, how are you feeling about this game in general? When you take into account uh, Newcastle, like I say, up and down, they're missing a lot of players. We've beaten them already this season. But then on the other hand, we're you know we've not had a great season. Uh, in terms of league position in comparison to them. And we've had our own injury issues as well, even if they are easing. So h- how are you feeling about the game? Yeah, I'm feeling really positive. I think the game's there to, to to be attacked. I think, you know, we proved six weeks ago when we went up there, around six weeks ago, that we can cause some serious problems. And, you know, we thoroughly deserve the, the 3-1 victory that we got. So they're going to be a little wounded from that, I would have thought, and maybe want to put the record straight in it. It should make for for a very good open attacking game. I, I think the points you're making around um, some of their injuries, I think, are very valid. Um, it feels like an opportune time to play them, perhaps, um, with you know doubts over Isak, Wilson, Anthony Gordon. I think there's a few others as well. So, you know, Friday night, um, Saturday, sorry, night under the lights, half past five. Last time we had that, man, you were down here. We turned them over. So I, I feel really, really positive. Let's just be, let's just attack the game. Um, they're a very good team. Of course they are. But it's the Premier League. They're all good teams. And, you know, if, if the, the real Newcastle, should I say, turn up, the one that beat Villa 3-1 away, it, it could be tricky. But, like I said, there's nothing to fear. And th- those players can go out and, and think to themselves, do you know what? Six weeks ago, we went up there, shocked them. Same type of foot performance again. Um, there are points there for the taking. So, yeah, in general, I'm looking forward to what should be a really good game with two sides that are trying to win, which should, should be really good to watch. Uh, we'll throw it straight to our lineups in a sec, but uh, just a quick word for our sponsors, Early Doors, in, in this show. Uh, the Trent Navigation open from 10 a.m. on Saturday for breakfast, and it's Man City v Everton at 12.30, Six Nations Rugby, Soccer Saturday on Sky, live music from Steve McGill. Get some lunch in the barbecue food court. Uh, and then, of course, Forest v Newcastle on the screens, inside and out for those of you who aren't going at the game. Uh, and then a post-match beer or soft drink if you're up for it to hopefully celebrate a win. And just quickly, as ever, here's a video to show you what the match day is experience here is all about. Uh, we'll see you in 17 seconds if you're listening, not viewing. Uh, but like I say, best uh, fan experience in Nottingham for those of you who are on iTunes and can't see this video. So get down there regardless if you can. Thank you very much. That was moderately more professional, wasn't it? The last two ones of those. Yeah, but, yeah, but that pie looks nice, doesn't it? On the thing, it I'm does. Quite... <laughs> I think Prutz is ready to drive over from Harrogate for one. He was very impressed with it the other day. Yeah, certainly. Right, let's uh, go look at a lineup that you've done. We'll talk through it, uh, and I'll say uh, if there's any changes I would make personally, but there aren't too many. So I'll read this out. As ever, for those listening or watching, uh, excuse me, Matt Sells in goal, uh, back for Montiel, Niacate, Murillo, and Nuno Tavares. And then Mikey's got Yates and Dominguez coming back into midfield after suspension in the week. Uh, in With Elanga, Gibbs White, and Callum Hudson Adoy in support of Taiwo Awanyi. Uh, looks a good team on paper, Mikey, especially that front four. But what, what's your thinking overall there? Yeah, that front four looks tasty, doesn't it? I've been going on about that for weeks. You know, if we can get all of them on the pitch fully fit for 90 minutes week in, week out, then we're going to cause some teams some serious problems. I think that's probably our first choice front four. Um, in terms of where the debate might arise, I guess, it, it's probably the, the fullback areas, I would have thought. Um, I've gone for Tavares and Montiel. It seems to me that those two are probably Nuno's first choice because... I think we've had, what, six, seven, eight games now where 
he's tried Williams there. He's he's, he's tried Toffolo. I just think he's going to go back to them too. I think I think he trusts them, and I think what they do give you is um, certainly Tavares is a bit of unpredictability down that left hand side. Um, and I guess if Gordon's not playing, I'm not sure who they're going to play uh, on the right. Hopefully, your Newcastle or uh, mate will tell us. Um, that that feels like an area we can have a go at Newcastle. So I've been quite bold with my team selection, and I think Nuno will be the same. Um, the midfield two quite interesting. So I've gone Yates and Dominguez. Um, there's a shout for Danilo, perhaps, but I think the fact that neither Yates nor Dominguez played uh, in the cup game against Bristol City and they started the last game at Bournemouth suggests to me that he's going to bring them two back in. So that's my thinking around that. We've already talked about the, those front four. If we can get 70, 80 minutes out of those four, uh, I'm, I'm really excited to see what they can bring. Um, and I guess maybe just the centre backs as well. So, um, Murillo and Omaban Medelli, oh, God, got it right then, um, have done really well. Um, however, and I said this more well, 10 minutes ago, but yesterday, if you watched yesterday's podcast, um, I, I'd love to see Niakate back in there. I think he's he's so dominant, he's so quick, he's so strong, um, and he looked the part uh, against Bristol City. And I think his partnership with Murillo before he went away to the African Nations uh, looked really good. You know, we got that clean sheet against um, uh, Villa. Um, and of course, Manchester United, I think those two played at the back as well in that win. And Musa can play on the right. You know, there's this myth around left foot to left side. But I don't buy into that. I think good, good players can pretty much play anywhere. And those two have proved that they've got a really tight, tight uh, relationship. So that's what I'd go for. I genuinely don't think, Matt, that's going to be too far off. There might be one or two that he tweaks, but... I, 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 I'm pretty sure that that's kind of what he's going to go for. Certainly that shape. Um, and just just for a hand, hand over to you, Matt, again. But I think the the back five that he tried for the cup game, um, I don't think he's going to bring that to the table in the league. I think it was probably, he was thinking it was born out of necessity because we had so many centre-backs, but that, that was kind of it. It gave a chance for Felipe to play. Um Maybe not 120 minutes, but he, he certainly put a shift in. Um, but I think he's probably seen enough to say, do you know what? Um, I'm going to go with back to a back four. I'm going to have those four up front, terrorising that Newcastle defence, which they did in the away game. Uh, and I'm just really excited. I genuinely think it's going to be a really good game. Um, high scoring, two attacking teams that are going to try and win the game. And I think if Nuno li lines up like that, that will, that will show his intentions from minute one. Very attacking. Uh, let's put the lineup back up. We'll throw up a couple of names, discuss a couple of points. You've already picked up on a, a few there, Mikey, but um, Ilanga's an interesting one because I think it depends more on who plays left back for Newcastle. I, kind of, I know Dan Burns a big threat from set pieces, but I hope it's him because um, you know Ilanga rinsed him in the first game. Uh, it could be Livramento, I, I guess, but if we can get Ilanga in spaces in behind again, it could be a, a fruitful afternoon for him, couldn't it? It could indeed, and I'm I'm with you, Matt. I, I hope they play Dan Burn, you know, with all due respect, very good player, but um Alanga tormented him, um, probably still having nightmares about him. And then the, the Luton lad the other week, is it Og Og Bene? I've got that wrong. Um, yeah, Og Bene. He absolutely destroyed him on occasions if you look at that those highlights. So he's very susceptible to pace in behind. And the way Forrest play, very quick on the transition, um, will obviously target that. So um I've got a funny feeling he might play Livramento, but if he does play Dan Byrne, I'll be uh, I'll be I'll be happy, and let's so hope we get a repeat performance from Alanga. But yeah, those format just it looks really really tasty. It's just about getting those on the football pitch for as long as possible, as many games as possible, because they they'll cause problems for any side. Um, we're recording this shortly before I think Nuno's doing press today as we record this. So we've not had a Gibbs White injury update. He was hobbling a lot, and Montiel was hobbling afterwards. So uh, Williams got good reviews uh, on Tuesday, and I wouldn't mind him playing right back. But I think Mikey's right that uh, Montiel's the first choice. But we could be looking at Gio Reyna needing to make an impact, you know, potentially from the start or coming on for Gibbs White, couldn't we? So there's going to be a, an onus on him, and it shows the importance of having that that squad depth in place, I guess. Oh, well, oh wow, does it? Doesn't it? Just um, yeah, Greg. Greg mentioned. Uh, you know, he's, he's obviously very excited. He watches Dortmund a lot. I've seen a little bit of him. Um, what he lacks in pace, he makes up for in, in intelligence, in movement. His first touch is always on point and he'll get better the amount of minutes that he plays. So 
uh, whilst it would be a huge blow to not have Morgan in the team, um, I wouldn't be too worried because we've got a great replacement lined up. Um, and even even if not, even if we do start with that front four, which I suspect I suspect they'll patch Morgan up. To be honest, he, he, I think he was all right. He, he was walking past me um, after the game. He, he seemed okay. Um, so if, if he plays, that's fine. Um, but Reina can also play on the left, can't he? So if we're not having any success down the wing, he, he can tuck in on the left. You can move Callum across to the right. It just gives us so many options, and it's it's uh, it's quite exciting to think about it. You know, if we do need a game changer or a game breaker, um, we now have that on the bench with with Gio Reina, and um, yeah, I'm excited to see what he can bring. I suppose the other area you already touched on it there, but I think centre half is just a really interesting. Uh, area for Nuno and the next game or two, maybe even this game will probably give us an indication of his hands because, like, like you say, Omar Ramadelli's done nothing wrong. Uh, Felipe, I don't think, can play two games in a week. So it's probably between him and Nia Kate. Is that kind of a long-term battle now or do you think Felipe can still force his way back in in the coming weeks? Um, I was surprised he played two hours <laughs> or whatever it was as Bristol City. Um, there were times when he when he turned and his, his, his lack of pace was evident, but he's a leader. When he when he's facing the game front up, um, he's great. He's very dominant in the air as well. You know, he won the won the header for the goal um, against Bristol. So um, I wouldn't expect him to start. Certainly not in a back four, if I'm honest, just because of that pace element. I think we've we've got near Kate back now. I think he's our best centre back. I know Mark and a few others on here are. Quite, quite big on uh, Willy Bolly um, because of his aerial dominance, absolutely. But he's not here. So if you look at the uh, options that we have, for me, it's Murillo and Nia Kati, with Nia Kati probably playing on that right-hand side, which he's very comfortable at doing. Like I said, you know, they've played together before and we've got good results. So for me, he comes back in. It is, you could say it's harsh on Omar Medelli. He's not done anything wrong, of course. It's just we're now at the point of the season where results start becoming premium um you know there's an argument to say every resort's premium but we're now in the we're getting to the business end now aren't we the second half of the season games are coming thick and fast uh two home games uh, you know in a row in a row um so i'm just hoping that near Kate comes back in uh because i think he, he, he gives you that leadership that strength that pace and you, you know we had a pretty decent tournament as well so Options again, positive options for for Nuno. So it'd be interesting to see who goes with, but but that's what I would do. Yeah, uh, the, I, I wouldn't mind if it's Tom Vimadeli or Nia Kate because it looks like Anthony Gordon's going to play up front because Wilson mm. probably can't start and Isaac's out. Then Harvey Barnes one side, Murphy the other side, uh, and then that midfield three they've got of Guimaraes, Miley, and um, Longstaff. They're not the biggest uh, team aerially. Which may maybe well they'll play Dan Byrne. So an athletic centre half in short and near Cate or I'm a, I'm a Bamadeli, I wouldn't have a problem with it all. And you know, they, they the younger two did so well against Bournemouth that I, I'd still probably edge Oma Bamadeli uh into selection for this game. But yeah, like you say, we can't go wrong. It's certainly good to have some of these AFCON lads starting to come back. Uh, last game, but that we're missing them. So hopefully we're in a stronger position. The bench looks uh, looks better going forwards. Um, any final thoughts on the game before I let you go, Mikey? Uh, just that I'll just reiterate. I think it's going to be a cracker. You know, it, some games just have the feel, don't they, of a big game, and the fact that it's televised under the lights, half past five on Saturday. You know, we mentioned it, uh, well, ten minutes ago, but yesterday, if you see yesterday's podcast, um, you know, the Newcastle fans, they're some of the best away fans. They'll be loud. They'll be up for it. That means it will have the domino effect to us. So I expect the, the atmosphere to be cracking and let's hope we get a, a really good spectacle and, and Forrest come out on top. But it's but it's a game that we shouldn't fear. You know, I cast my mind back to last time we played Newcastle at home um, last year and we lost to a, what was it, last minute penalty. Um, we struggled a little bit in the second half, but this is a different team now. You know, we've got options going forward. You know, we've just spent five minutes talking about which centre-back to, to play in a back four and how attacking do we be? So this team has a very different feel and look about it rather than the team that faced them here last time when we lost 2-1. So um, that will play a part. And I also think the fact that we, we did them six weeks ago will play a part as well. Um, there shouldn't be any lack of belief in that team because all, all you do is say, well, this is how we hurt them. You know, in, in uh, recent memory, we hurt them bad. 
So let's do it again. Let's suck them onto us and let's break quickly and get in behind those full backs because they couldn't handle it last time. So let's let's hope we we uh, we we have the same sort of repeat performance. But no, I'm um you probably can tell I'm genuinely excited. I think it's going to be a cracker. Hopefully so. Hopefully so. Our last name I was going to mention quickly is Matt Sells because uh, home debut, I assume. I mean, you know, fair play to Matt Turner the other night. I'm sure Sells will play against his only club he's played for in England where it didn't really work for him. So I imagine he'll want to prove a point to those Newcastle fans and the Forest fans to show them what he's all about, having had a you know a perfectly solid game against Bournemouth. So hopefully he does well. Right, uh, we'll leave it there with Mikey and then uh, I'm going to throw in a video with uh, Rob Smythe to get the Newcastle fan perspective and I'll see you on the other side of that. It's about 20 minutes long. So uh, Mikey, thank you very much. Hey, not a problem at all, Matt. Thanks. Thank you very much, everyone. We'll see you on the other side of the video with Rob. So it's funny, um, looking at each team, they're both very up and down, especially Newcastle, even more so this season, it seems. How are you feeling about this game in general before we get into a few specifics around Newcastle? Complete flip of a coin, I think, with Newcastle at the minute. I think, ironically, it's ever since that game against Forest at St James's Park, the form has been so wildly uneven, it's it's ridiculous. One week you'll get a fantastic performance, the next week they'll get battered and then, and then it'll be a really dull, uninspiring draw. And I think that's the one thing from that's come about, especially during the last couple of months from Newcastle. Last, last season, when they had that amazing run to the Champions League in the top four, they... They had such consistency and they got ahead of steam and it just it was like a runaway train that nobody could catch. Whereas this season, it's just been so stop-start. They can't get the rhythm that really helped them last season. And that's why I just think you, you, you cannot call what you're going to get this weekend. It could be trouncing for either side, a really high-scoring draw or a really boring game. And I think that's, that's everything. That's a bit of form, a bit of injuries, a bit of people coming back from different tournaments. And that's why it, I just... I wouldn't like to put any, put any kind of money on it at all at the minute because I just couldn't tell you what what side what side you're going to get first off and what performance you're going to get either. Mm. And what's gone wrong this season? Is it simply just down to this cascade of injury and Champions League football, or have teams worked them out a bit? What What do you think? I think it, a mix of all of them. I think definitely, as is with teams, what happens when they have one of these brilliant seasons? They have been worked out a bit. They have had terrible injuries, but so have a lot of other teams. The fixture congestion, I don't think, is as much as an issue as people make out. Recruitment has been OK, if not brilliant, and perhaps needed a bit more, but have been strangled a bit by these um, financial fair play restrictions. And also, I think it's a bit of kind of returning to the norm. Last season was such a high pitch that they overachieved massively with a, with a squad that wasn't Champions League worthy. And this is probably where they're about and should be between probably 7th and 11th, challenging for a cup is where in their development at the minute is probably where they should be. And last season was such a success and it looked so brilliant that it almost kind of wildly changed people's expectations when it shouldn't have been. It, what would have really helped, I think, Newcastle would have been flipping the seasons around, having this season, last season, where they perhaps finished ninth and got had a really good cup run. And then, the, and then this season be the one where they progressively get better and progress into the Champions League. And unfortunately, it's come the other way around. So on paper, this won't look like a good season, but it's actually perhaps where they should be in their development. So Howe's not under any pressure then? He's not a victim of his own success? You think his job's safe at the moment? I think from a fan's point of view, he can, he can do no wrong. There's a lot of understanding with the mitigating circumstances. There's a few grumbles here and there, but nowhere near as bad as we've seen in the past with the likes of Steve Bruce. There's an understanding. And I think from an ownership point of view as well, it looks like, you know, there's definitely no issue this year. He'll see definitely be at the club in the summer and guide the recruitment and props quite a big reshuffle of the team and definitely be leading the club into next season, bar anything major happening. I think if we had a similar season next season, there'd be big questions to ask because obviously it becomes more of a pattern then. But at the minute, I, I really couldn't see a, a change taking place and I don't know who you'd bring in that would make any kind of difference because the, the team has been made in such of his own image and his style that it takes so much to un unpack that, you know, that's a change you wouldn't make until it'd be the off-season. And I, I just think he's got he's got the support of the fans, the, te the, the city and the owners, which is most important, I suppose, at the minute. Uh, if we look at a few kind of specifics of this game, 
the, I think Isak's out injured. Wilson seems like he's half fit at best, and he's generally half fit anyway. Uh, uh, Anthony Gordon looks like, I was just reading just before we started recording, he's going to miss this game, but maybe come back soon, which is good for Newcastle uh, in the longer term. And then Harvey Barnes seems like he's fit, and he might even start up front. I don't know. Is that the biggest area of concern for you? Yeah, I think, like we said at the start, one of the big things is that there's these been rolling injuries where seemingly he gets one person back and another goes out. And at the minute, we've had it in defence, we've had it in midfield, and now it's the turn of attack. And we were, we were a bit light there anyway, but we didn't bring anybody in either in the summer or January. And it's just kind of showcasing that at the minute. Um, Gordon's been deputising up front. Wilson, like you say, is, I'm afraid, he's, he's been a brilliant signing for Newcastle, but he is just perennially injury prone. And Isaac has these fits and spurts as well. So it is, Gordon's out for the weekend, so it's probably going to be, Barnes in a false nine, which is not ideal either because he's only played 30 minutes really of football. He came on at the weekend against Luton and that was his first game back since around September the 20th. So we're going to look a bit of a blunt instrument in attack anyway. And the other thing that worries from an attack point of view is not the fact that A, we've got to just start Barnes up front who's not really match fit and not had many minutes, but then there's not many options coming off the bench after say 50 or 60 minutes if we need to give him a rest or really change the game, perhaps if we're 2-0 down. So uh, from a Forest point of view, I'd see that as a massive plus, that there's A, limited options to start with, and B, very limited options to actually make a change in the second half. Um, if we go back through the team as well, I suppose midfield, um, I think Joe Linton missed the previous game. Now he's going to miss the whole season, basically. Um, have they fixed those problems with Lewis Miley and Guimaraes and Longstaff's back? Are they are they back to being decent there or is that a, a worry for you? No, and again, it's one of the things that kind of overshadowed the January month of January in the transfer window is that they were desperate to get a midfielder in of any kind of shape or form, but they couldn't because of the financial fair play rules. Um, and I think it's really going to start showing the next couple of weeks. The only midfield we've really got is uh, Bruno, is Longstaff and is Miley. You know, Miley's 17, he shouldn't be playing every week. And the other two need a bit of support. And I think it's shown, A, that they did need that other body, which they couldn't get out through the line because of finances. B, that Joe Linton, what a, what a massive miss he is going to be for the rest of the season. And just the fact that those three are now the only midfielders, which means, really, there's no rotation. So there's no surprise for Nuno and his staff this week that they know that that midfield three is going to start, even when perhaps potentially after the weekend, they would need to reshuffle it, but they can't. So they're playing relatively well. Longstaff started scoring a few goals, which is good. Bruno is, you know, on his day, he's fantastic and one of the best midfielders I've, I've seen in Newcastle in recent years. And Miley is an amazing talent. But it's like we were just saying with the attack, when they need to drop in that bit of freshness to just give them some extra legs or perhaps a bit of defensive support, they've just not got, got it on the bench anywhere in those key positions. So again, it just gives you that bit of worry that, that on paper, the starting eleven looks relatively strong and straightforward, but it's when you need to change it up is that when the issue comes about. What's your take on FFP out of curiosity? Forrest have fallen foul of it when they've got an owner who's got the funds to invest. Obviously, it's on a different level in Newcastle and going, you know, not touching the state ownership stuff uh, as, a, as a separate issue, but in terms of a football club with lots of wealth, uh, are you frustrated that the FFP rules, does it feel like a closed shop that the big six that you're very much trying to break into? Uh, yeah, I think on paper it definitely looks like that. I think the thing you always have to caveat it with is that these rules that, we, that the clubs complain about, it makes me laugh when the clubs moan about them because they did all vote them in at one point. Mm. But I do think they need readdressing. The like limits for spending were set at a time when transfers were completely different, where you know, a Bruno would have probably cost you 10 million instead of 40 million and an Isaac would have cost 20 instead of 60. So I think the limits need redressing as well. And I think the way that I would look at it is there's there's plenty of ideas banded about is that if you've got owners like the likes of Forest and perhaps on another level at Newcastle is that if they want to invest their own personal wealth or the, the wealth of whatever company, etc., is that they have to put potentially like a bond in place where it almost gives them a backstop. So if one day they decide to A, pull their funding, or B, decide to walk away, that there's that bond in place that ensures that finances are covered for a certain amount of times, a year, 18 months. And then that would allow the clubs to spend what they want. Because at the minute, it's just 
you know, we shouldn't be all, no football fans should be sitting here worrying about balance sheets and profits and loss. We should, it's ridiculous, really, when you think about how interested we are, because it's quite, it is interesting in a way, but it's quite boring. But I think there look, there's got to be better ways of policing it and allowing people to invest in sport. Because if you look at any other sports or even entertainment industries, the, these kind of restrictions just would never be there. Because if people, if, if people, somebody owned something or wanted to grow something, they'd just be within reason allowed to do it. So I think the big thing for me is that it just needs to be looked at again and, and given a modern sheen. Because I think at the minute the system is just not right for the modern age where football related inflation, especially, is just completely different from even five years ago, let alone tennis when the, the rules were put in place. But I think that's going to be looked at this time round and it'll be interesting because otherwise what will happen, what's happened to Everton twice and Forest will ha will eventually happen to everybody because everyone will make a slip up where, or, or make a decision like Forest did with um, Brennan Johnson where they go, we were going to sell X in Y, but we did it six months later to get in £30 million pound more or whatever. And it means we're falling foul. And I just think eventually everybody will fall foul of it in some way, shape or form. So and then it will become almost redundant because everybody will be docked 10 points or fined £50 million. Pounds. So it's something I just think that needs to be addressed. And and that's not just me saying that because we've got you know, the, the sovereign wealth fund behind Newcastle. I think it just as a, I'd have said that if Mark Ashley was in charge still, because I just think there's never going to be a level playing field, but there are ways where other teams can be allowed to come to the fore and have a go, but have a go in a potentially protected environment so it doesn't put the future of the football club at risk. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, the, I think they were drawn up in 2013. You can lose yeah. 135 million quid over a period or whatever it is, and the game's changed. And also it feels like um, academy players are just like cash cows now for the biggest clubs. Like, oh, we, we can, you know, Lewis Miley, we can sell to Man City for £90 million of pure profit in two years. And, uh, you know, that solves all our problems. That shouldn't be, to me, how the academies are run. But it does feel like they're becoming that way, certainly. Um, well, we've, had, we've had one of the cases, the players that we've signed, is Lewis, Lewis Hall from Chelsea left back. We've, he's on loan initially, but I think we've got an obligation to buy him for £28 million, And that'll be £28 million pure profit for Chelsea. But there was a massive outcry from Chelsea fans when we initially signed him on loan because he was breaking into the first team, you know, giving amazing performances. And all of a sudden, it's like with the, some of their other players that Chelsea have got, the Conor Gallagher's and the like, it, like I say, it just becomes a conveyor belt. And that's not what clubs want to see. We all understand that eventually we have to sell players. Look like Forrest have done it, haven't they, with Mangala. They perhaps didn't want him to go, but I've understood that for various financial reasons it makes sense and, and I think Newcastle will face this dilemma in the summer where they I think they will sell one of the big hitters but it shouldn't be at the benefit of everybody all of a sudden next season you don't want to say well for Longstaff, Miley and etc we can get 100 million of pure profit let's just get rid of them it should be we'll maybe have to sell one every three years and combine that with extra growth and investment but um, again, this is where these financial rules hamper everybody. And for saying the cash cow that the Premier League is and all the eyeballs on it, in some ways, it's still quite archaic. And hopefully mm. they'll be able to come up with some kind of compromise that suits everybody as best as they can do in the coming months and years. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, the other player I was going to ask you about is uh, left-back. Not necessarily the most high-profile area of any team, but with Newcastle, obviously, Elanga, Rince, Stanburn, at St. James's Park. Um, what's your take? I mean, I, I like Livramento, but you see a lot more of them than me. Is Eddie Howe too stubborn with, with Dan Byrne, who I'm sure is a good player, but I really hope he plays and the Langers matched up against him again with the with the pace he has at the weekend? Yeah, it's an interesting one with Dan Byrne. I think a lot of people always forget as well that he isn't actually a left-back. He's played there primarily for Newcastle, but he, he was bought as a centre-back and started his career at Newcastle. Um, as as a centre half, and he's kind of merged, and he, and he has made that role his own, and he's had some amazing performances, but he has had some poor ones as well. And unfortunately for a bloke his size I and mean, the way that he plays, somebody who's got pace can get at him. And unfortunately, the the previous Forest game was a great example. And, and on at the weekend against Luton against Doug Benet, um, he got taken to the cleaners, and that happens. That can happen to the best players in the world. It can happen to anybody. But um, I think. He was kept into the team on Saturday for dealing with Luton's set-piece um, attributes. But it became clear very early on that 
he was not going to get much out of the game. Livermento came on and all of a sudden that side looked a bit more sure. A lot of people forget as well, everyone keeps clamouring for Livermento to start and he has been fantastic. But he is actually a right back and mm. unfortunately he's slotting into the place. But for me, I think knowing what happened in the previous game, knowing that pretend if Alanga is going to play, for me, it is one where you do, you go, Dan's brilliant, is still brilliant and has, an, has got an amazing job to do for the, still for the team. But circumstances just show that they need a different type of left back to drop in. And and I think that is Livermento. He's not let the side down yet in any of the games he's played. It's only a handful, admittedly, but he looks like a cracking player. And I think one of the reasons that he has been kind of kept back is that what I'd spoken about before is that we've had so few options off the bench. He is a player that is able to give us a bit of a threat either up front or on either side of the fullbacks, and so he was almost kept as our kind of our only reserve attacker. So with a few others coming back, potentially, I think he will get some more game time now. But like you say, I think on the back of Saturday's performance, on one hand, I wouldn't be surprised if you kept him in because House very loyal. But if you did it on hard facts based on performance and statistics, Livermento would be starting at left back on Saturday. Yeah, I suppose I, I could come back to bite me, me saying I really want Burns to play because he is a set from, threat from set pieces and we can't defend them for Toffee. So uh, that might be another reason why he plays. Um, anyone from Forest that worries you before we wind up? Uh, ironically, before obviously he got out injured is that we probably saw Chris Wood's best ever performance in a Forest shirt and at, a Newcastle, and at Newcastle's ground when we last played it with his amazing performance. And you know, you obviously see them more than me, but from a distance, he seemed to have found a bit of a groove before his injury, and mm. I think that took a lot of that took a lot of the team back when we played last um, and that game. And I think he would have been a massive threat because there's a bit of indecisiveness in what was previously a rock solid defence, especially with Nick Pope. I think Dubravka coming back in in goal has unease the situation at the back, which was so formidable last season. So he's he's a big one for me. I really. You know, there's a lot of players like him in the Premier League, but Alanga with that pace, it's just pace is frightening in the Premier League and it's such an amazing attribute. And um, as shown against someone the likes of Dan Byrne, if you can get in behind, if you've got any kind of end product, you can really have, you know, a, a killer instinct. Um, it'd be interesting to see, just from a personal point of view as well, what's happening with the goalkeeping situation at Forest, because obviously they've signed former Newcastle um, goalkeeper Matt Sells, who... It was, I wouldn't say a disaster, but it just didn't work out. It was a massive high-profile signing for Newcastle under Rafa Benitez. Um, started the championship season for us as number one, made a couple of high-profile ricks, got replaced by a form, another former Forest goalkeeper in Carl Darlow and then just almost disappeared into the ether. By all accounts, you read that he's had a, a kind of bit of a career resurgence since, which is great. And I'd be really interested to see what happens there. But obviously, the goalkeeper last night, Matt Turner, did some great heroics. So I don't know whether Matt Sells is fit or not, or whether what the question is with that one. But I'd just be interested, from a personal point of view, to see the differences from what we saw five or six years ago. Because the keeper that we saw was not even championship standard. So hopefully, he has got a lot better from a Forest point of view, at least. Well, he played pretty well at Bournemouth, and uh, he'll play on Saturday just because he. Couldn't play in the first. He wasn't registered with Forest in the first leg, so right. he couldn't play in the replay. So Matt Turner came in, and yeah, I was pleased for Matt Turner. We'll have discussed that on a previous podcast. This comes out, but yeah, you don't want to see players fail. So I was happy for Turner to do well. Right, uh, I'm not going to ask you for a score prediction because they're always pointless. You'll probably say a, a, a draw or something. What did you said? Um, you, I, said you say? I said a yeah. draw. I said a, I said a draw, um, and, and that was yeah, incredibly optimistic. And then obviously. Within about ten minutes of watching it, it would it was uh, it would I would probably say it's probably one of two of the worst performances Newcastle put and put for it. It's the worst home game I've seen this season from them. They just mm. completely capitulated, and like I said, it was almost a culmination in the last game against Forest of everything that could go wrong, injury wise, performance wise, did and started this kind of up and down. So I'd snap your hand off for a draw right now, but it it, it could be anything. Like I said, if you give me ten pounds, say put this bet on, I wouldn't know what way to do it at all so um let's just hope it's a good game and everyone's happy at the end cliche alert <laughs> i'm not sure i take a point now um yeah i think we, we need to win games so and this feels well, like and, I, and, and we're the same for me we were coming into this run of the games where we had luton on saturday forest followed by bournemouth and for me after we'd had such a strange run of games against really big like top four sides that's no offense to any of the teams we're playing the next couple of weeks 
this was a, a kind of run where I, th I think we needed at least seven points. So we've already, we've already kind of in a way dropped points against Luton at home. So for me, we do need to win against Forest and we do need to get, win against Bournemouth to have kind of any chance of cementing a European spot, really. So we need to win, but I just have no confidence, unlike I would have done last season, that we actually will. So I'm looking forward to the game. I think it'll be good under the lights on a Saturday. You can't beat that, really. So it should hopefully be a good game and hopefully Newcastle come away with the three points. Well, I almost said hopefully so, but hopefully not on the last part. But uh, <laughs> thanks for joining us again, Rob. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks, Rob, and thanks to Mikey, of course, as well, for joining us earlier in the show. A uh, bit of news to round up before we depart then. Uh, some of you might have seen this already, but it was announced last night. Uh, Forrest named their 25-man squad for the rest of the season. There's five goalkeepers in it, so all the five senior keepers, which is obviously unusual, but there's lots of under-21s uh, on the books, and they don't need to be registered players like Murillo, Omavama, Delhi, people like that. So I don't think there's anything to worry about in the squad uh it just probably shows we've got some business to do in the summer but uh i think it's all fine on that front uh some transfer news as well pangy joe's completed his uh loan to antalya sport if i'm saying that right in turkey uh so uh that's him gone for the rest of the season remo freuler's uh move to bologna is now a permanent one as we mentioned on monday and uh away from the men's team uh just a quick plug for forest women as we did on Thursday, they've got Everton in the FA Cup, fifth round, one of only two non-WSL teams remaining, flying the flag. So good luck to them. Uh, their game is on Sunday at Grange Park. That's the home of Long Eaton. 4pm uh, kickoff, you can get your tickets through the Forest website. So uh, do go and support the team. If you can, it's a great day for families. A good way to introduce kids to football as well, I found, because uh, you get to kind of meet the players afterwards. Have lots of photos taken with them, which you might not get when there's 30,000 at the city ground. So I know my kids loved it. So uh, a good way to introduce young children to football, as I said. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow with uh, the post-match stream for the Newcastle game. And then on Monday with Calvin Wilson as the main guest. So as ever, uh, thanks for joining me. If you have enjoyed this, do us a favour, hit like, hit subscribe. You can become a channel member if you want. And if you're listening, do give us a five-star review on iTunes and Spotify. And like I always say, I do read all the reviews on iTunes. Thanks very much for your company today. Uh, a bit of a bits and pieces match preview away from the normal way of doing it. So uh, thanks for your patience with that one. And as I say, we're back tomorrow. So hopefully you can join us then. In the meantime, have a good day, uh, enjoy the game tomorrow, and we shall see you soon. <laughs>